wanted to have our panelists briefly introduce yourselves and uh, maybe just maybe give your perspective on what you see as your biggest challenge today as far as from an engineering perspective in your job. And, and, and obviously, there's a lot of change going on. So, Jonathan? Yes. Uh, hello, my name is Jonathan Sharon. I'm with Dynamic Fiber Services. Um, I have been out in the broadcast world for many, many years now, and I've seen changes from the SD to the HD world. And now that we're starting to see changes to the, the Ultra HD, you're going to start coming into the issues that you dealt with when converting from SD to HD. Um, and I'm seeing that quite a bit. A lot of, a lot of, there's golf events that I do work where 4K is being tried, um, and it's not making it, and finding out of distance limitations. Um, you know, this could be because of either certain gear, this could be because of older fiber, um, this could be because of bad connections. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of variables to making long distance uh, live ultra HD transmissions. Mark? Hi. Uh, Mark Ritchie, uh, owner of HD Optics and Camera. I'm also a live director. Um, I guess one of the challenges that I'm seeing is we've just got so many great options these days. You know, there's just so many more tools and that are afforded to us than we've ever had before. And it's finding ways to integrate them into the system seamlessly, uh, whether it be in 1080 or 4K. And, uh, you know, one of the challenges is in the technical world, we get really comfortable with things that work because we trust that workflow. And when you're in a live environment, there's nothing better than feeling comfortable. Um, but that's the last thing you are these days when you're trying to be on the edge of doing some fun and exciting and immersive content, whether it's 360 or GoPros or cable cameras or movies. Uh, you know, it just doesn't matter. We have to find ways to make that work. Uh, you know, so communication, a lot of times doing the tests, um, you know, really putting our heads together and trying to figure out ways to get past uh, integrating these systems within has been one of my biggest problems. 4K, you know, I've done about maybe six or seven shows now in 4K, and whether we're recording, I do a lot of the cinema style stuff, uh, so mostly the uh, mirrors and the dragons, that sort of uh, application is what we see the most, so we're recording ISO and 1080 into the line cuts, but now with the 4K Sony system, Obviously, we're taking live. So there's just a lot of workflow to push through to figure out and really understand what the goals are of each project, how it's going to be delivered, if it's live to tape or live to broadcast. So, I mean, we could talk about that for hours, but definitely something to talk about. Jim? Yeah, hi. Uh, Jim Toten. I'm a freelance engineer and tech manager, tech producer. And, um, you know, the last couple of years that I've been really deep digging deep in the freelance world, I find myself in a, in a, a wide gamut from doing high-end stuff like Super Bowls to low-end stuff, regional sports, and there's a big uh, a disparity between the high-ends and the low-ends. It seems like the middle ground is kind of going away, and so you've got these all-in-one small, complete uplink trucks. They're trying to do everything in one truck to these huge compounds with a dozen trucks. And it, it's interesting because you know, the, the talk of 4K comes up, but nobody really wants to do it. They're experimenting with it, but nobody's really digging into it. And I kind of have, I keep having the discussions, what about 1080p? And it seems like we're going to jump over 1080p60 or 5994 and go right into this new world of 4K when there's still a lot to be explored out there. Um, Jim Lucas is here. He designed a, a, a 1080p flight pack that we did surfing uh, last year with. And it was, a, it was a challenge just to do 1080p. So trying to do 4K is going to be even more. So there's this constant kind of change where we had a few years of stagnant kind of simple HD was kind of easy. Now it's complicated again. And again, a lot of people are, are confused as what they want, and there's still discussion of frame rates, there's discussion of color space and all these things. And, and another thing I want to add to is um, the, the use of film tools in live TV now. I was in, uh, in the Philadelphia Eagle Stadium where they've got uh, F-55s, and they're using a, a, a film mode for pregame stuff, and they switch over to the HD mode with two-third inch lenses for the game stuff. So there's all this convergence Lots of challenges. Sure. Bob? Hi, I'm uh, Bob Curtez, and um, I basically uh, have run into three things that I find a little um, difficult to deal with in 4K. The first is moving the signal around. Um, there are manufacturers pushing 6G and 12G. 12 gigabits is an astonishing amount of data to squeeze down a piece of coax, and currently the cable manufacturers are having real problems keeping up. Uh, you take a 12G signal, you can push it through three, four feet of coax before it falls off the cliff. 
And that's if you have good connectors. So really, fiber is the future in terms of moving the signal around. Uh, the second problem I see is that it is getting increasingly difficult uh, to convince producers that a $500 4K camera is not the same as a $5,000 4K camera, is not the same as a $50,000 4K camera. Just because it says 4K, it doesn't mean that you're going to get an image that you're going to like. And the third problem I see, and this is <coughs> starting to be really an interesting problem, is that manufacturers are coming out with a new camera every four weeks. Take a breath. Let it settle in a little bit. Not only is it economically difficult to actually make a profit if you're going to come out with a new camera four weeks from now, but nobody has the opportunity to learn the camera, to get the best out of it. Um, and and uh, I really pride myself in making good pictures, but if the, if the camera I'm handed on set is not the camera I was told it was going to be there because we got a beta version of this new really hot thing, there are going to be issues. So take a breath, use fiber to move the signals around. So, so um, there you go. People, take a breath. Everybody just take a breath, <laughs> a deep breath. So, well, here's, here's what I find fascinating with the, from an engineering perspective is, um, and I obviously spend most of the time going to sports events, and, and you know, y so you go to an event like, let's go off the charts, like the Olympics, and what you have are these amazing HD workflows that have had about fo four years, five years to really mature, because really, if you think about it, HD has really only been around since probably 2007, right, 2008. Um, and people really weren't comfortable with it until about 2012, right? So already we're saying, well, that's old news. So, but you have all these clients who are going to expect to say, we want to do UHD. And when they're going to make that move, they're going to want to make it with all the, the benefits and the simplified workflows that they have today with HD. So how do you prepare them? I mean, you mentioned the, four, the $500 camera that can't be like the, the, the $50,000, $500,000 camera. How do you temper their expectations? Understand, you understand when we go to UHD, it's going to become much more difficult to do your show. So how do you sort of have that conversation with them and help them understand it? Um, I have actually uh, had the opportunity to, to work a golf event where they were trying to do the 4K um, on physical connectors um, uh, rather than a spliced option. Um, I had showed them the spliced option. We were able to gain a lot more distance with it. Um, as opposed to the physical connection, which is generally how a lot of these events are, are done, whether it be baseball, football, or golf, doesn't matter. You're going through uh, a physical connection infrastructure. And in, in doing that, y you can cause quite a bit of back reflection, and then you're, you're going to find yourself stuck. Well, the levels look good, light levels look good, um, but for somebody who isn't, uh, isn't knowledgeable about that and how to work around that, um, it's going to be a lot harder for just the average technician to be able to work and get try to get 4K, even going in an, in an MLB stadium, um, having to go through their infrastructure. Um, so it's just it's a give and take on the physical connection on the physical connections as well as it's a great way to do it if you can do it spliced. So about 10 years ago, I think Marty Meyer um, asked me to come help with a class being taught at uh, Wexler. Maybe it was longer for the first HD camera, the F900. And it was just amazing to watch people stumble around this new technology from the small little switches to the little print and what does this do, what's a, what's a, what's a, what's a knee? You know, um, and I think we're back here again. And just the fact that we've been in 1080 HD for so long, people aren't really thinking it's a big jump to UHD, and it is, it's, it's four times the signal. And uh, I think one of the things that's, uh, that we need to do is really sit down with our producers and have this conversation and go over workflow, figure out why they made this choice, what's important, where it's going to live, how it's going to live, and, and really educate them. I think as engineers and as craftsmen, it's always been about communication within our group. You know, the, he, we've heard people talk about hiring people that you can trust. Well, part of that trust is informing them of what they can and cannot do. So, you know, this is a whole new animal uh, that, that's, you know, that, and we're just still figuring stuff out, I would imagine. Uh, so I think th it's our responsibility to sit down and really go over what their expectations are and what our limitations are thus far. And then, of course, you can't get it for a nickel.
uh, you know, this new technology isn't inexpensive, and you can't shoot for the same price for it as you will for 1080 because it's just not there yet. So I, I guess for me, it's always just about uh, just making sure that they're cool with the expectations. Right. And Paul? I, I agree with you there. You know, we have a, uh, an industry that's moving by leaps and bounds. I mean, it used to be a 10-year refresh cycle. Then it was a 7-year refresh cycle. Now we're looking into a 5-year refresh cycle. Uh, as you said before, we're barely into 1080p, and we're already jumping to UHD. Uh, we feel that it's really important to have an infrastructure that can support any number of these things uh, as you go down the road. Uh, to your point, Bob, you've got to have a facility of how to control these things. So if your infrastructure doesn't have the ability to allow you to route your signals and take your signals to where they need to go, uh, and to your point, get there in a, uh, <laughs> in a fashion that's going to allow it to get to the endpoints, uh, you're really not going to get where you need to be. So it's really a question of building those infrastructures so that you can have the endpoints creating the, the, the cameras that are creating the signals and the switchers and so forth that are processing those signals uh, at the end of the cycle um, and being able to engineer those systems so that they can be used in the field. So for an aw let's, let's take an award show. And I guess reality shows too. Well, let's take, no, let's take an award show. Let's take an actual live, live show. Uh, and on the sports side, you know, one of the big debates is, okay, frame rate, right? So uh, for an episodic, for a drama, 24 frames, has that look. Uh, for sports, we, you know, we did a little survey. When it comes to frame rate, our members say 120 hertz, 120 frames per second, which is going to be, you know, a little difficult. So would you feel comfortable working on a live award show that was 24 frames per second, or do you think it's going to look... I know the MTV kind of does it a little bit, right? The MTV Music Award thing were 24 frames. But what's your sense on 24 frames versus 60 frames? And can you tell a producer, hey, this, this is going to have to look good at 24 frames? Well, a um, <coughs> little bit of history here. When uh, High Def and 24P first came out, uh, MTV decided that they were going to uh, broadcast their uh, MTV Awards show. They were going to shoot it and broadcast it in 24P. And the various reviews the next day said, I saw a documentary of the MTV Music Awards <laughs> last <laughs> night. Because high frame rates in people's lizards' brains say this is live. Um, I have a rather large set at home that I love to watch football on. And in the morning, the game is on CBS at 1080i. And in the afternoon, the game is on Fox at 720p. And uh, my wife, who is a complete civilian and knows nothing about these things, asked me, how come the morning show looked more live? High frame rates look more live, but then you have 72 semis worth of data to deal with. And the reality about all of this stuff is the big elephant in the room that no one really wants to talk about, but I keep asking this question, how are you going to get this into my house? The only thing that's coming into my house right now is Netflix streaming, and it's the same stepped-on MPEG signal that I'm getting from Time Warner. It's MPEG-2, it's 420, it's 8 bits. You've got the exact same crappy signal. There's just four times as many pixels in it. We need to move forward and, and standardize and make 2020 the rule of the land so that we have better color space and, and give people something for their money besides um, a, a set that they really can't see the difference in when they're sitting 12 feet away. So HDR, high, high dynamic range where you have, instead of the 10 to 11 stops that we have now, you have 15 or 16 stops of dynamic range and the whites are truly white and the blacks are truly black uh, there was a screening at the, the, the Chinese by uh, the Chinese theater by uh, of, uh, of Furious Seven, uh, an adequate movie, uh, but it was uh, shot and shown in true 4K HDR, and I have never seen blacks and whites as I saw there. It is really truly stunning, and the, and a broad color space. When we went from SD to HD, I was astonished at what magenta and cyan actually looked like. That looks, and I'm looking forward to seeing many more colors and subtle secondaries when we go to 4K, but we have to do that. We can't stay in Rec. 709, and uh, I mean, we really have to step up the game. It's not enough to add four times as many pixels. 
you know, something specifically you were, you were asking about was the 24 versus 60. I like, you know, for the sports I do like watching, and it's 60. But, you know, I'm also a cinematographer, so I really enjoy shooting in 24 frames, and I've struggled heavily in over the last year in the live world, um, working with 24 frames. Um, we have a lot of legacy equipment out there, the trucks, signals, satellites, and how do you deal with 24? Uh, I'll tell you right now, the way you do deal with it is you get an alchemist box. That's about the only way I've survived these days is shooting 24 frame and then converting it through the alchemist because any other box just doesn't do it justice. You just, uh, once you see it up on a big screen, you just, it, uh, the interlacing just falls apart. Um, but that's been the biggest problem. I do a lot of shows, uh, music shows, and the artists want 24 frames and they want that cinematic look. And I agree, I think it looks great for that venue. Um, but the problem is, you know, the cameras, a lot of the cameras will do 2398, but then it stops at the switcher, or it stops at the bird, or it stops at the truck. So I constantly am up against, you know, legacy equipment, and it's not a bad thing, but people aren't, there. you know, everyone tells me no, all day long, no, it can't be done, and then we find ways to do it. So I would just suggest, you know, there, there are ways to do it, uh, it's getting better, the Alchemist box did save my butt many times. Um, we've tried it with other converter boxes that didn't succeed so well, but uh, the last Kanye show was shot and broadcast in 59.94, but shot in 24p. And that was, uh, that was a solution to it. Well, the ten, let's talk 1080p, because you all mentioned 1080p, which <coughs> I was talking with um, Larry Thorpe with Canon, <coughs> and he was, and everybody knows Larry Thorpe for the most part, if you know engineering. And he said, you know, no one's really seen what 1080p 60 would even look like if it was broadcast and then up converted through a 4K UHD set. It may look really good because that's the rumor. That's what we keep hearing. So do you think 1080p, and I know Money of Football is done at 1080p 60, but again, it's not delivered to anywhere. It's just produced in 1080p and then sent it to the home at <coughs> 720. So what's your sense on 1080p 60? Should an award show look at 1080p 60 as a production when we get to the UHD world and say, you know what, let's just not try to go all UHD, 4K, let's just do 1080p, 60, and be happier? I remember in the uh, early days of HD when we were showing side-by-side -side comparison between SD uh, 525 and, and a new HD, and we were using the early uh, uh, Sony uh, Plasma 42-inch, and I took the output of one of our cameras, SDI, put it component into the plasma, put it next to an HD camera, and people were aghast at how good the SD looked. They thought that was HD. And just like now, we're, you know, the consumer has never really seen 1080p in all its glory because of compression and interlace and other networks and regular you know, 720p. Um, just like nobody's really got to see NPSC in its all its glory. And so I, I, I think there is some legs for 1080p60, um, at least for, for the near term here until the 4K uh, infrastructure issues are worked out. At NAB earlier uh, last year, I mean, I'm not sure if you got to see the up 1080 stuff. It was phenomenal. Uh, like, I have my jaw dropped. I'm like, wow, if my set looked this good, I would just be a happy man. And they were doing phenomenal up jobs. I, I mean, look, I'm going to say the thing that nobody wants to hear, which is the only reason why we're going 4K is because somebody wants to sell more TVs. You know, if they just ran out of the reasons to sell us a TV, no one's knocking on my door screaming for 4K for television. You know, in the feature world, the effects world, you know, yes, I, it makes complete sense. But um, honestly, you give me a 1080 signal that doesn't fall apart, right? And I'm a happy guy. Well, um, again, the big question is, how are you going to get this into my house? Um, the, s the satellite companies have a little bit of freedom. They can take one or two transponders, and I, I, I know that DirecTV or, or DISH or both have experimented with 24-frame movies on uh, their premium channels, HBO and so forth, as an experiment. I don't know if it's ongoing. Um, but, again, it has to come into the house in some manner. It has to get to you in some manner. It's not good enough to have it die in the truck or in the control room and then become something else. Um, I, I think we need to, to put the horse before the cart and, and say, okay, w we're going to establish, let's say, two transmission standards. One is 1080p60, the other one is UHD at, at, at maybe 30 or, or, or more frames. Um, I think it's pretty much time to kill interlace dead. I think uh, I think whatever we do should be progressive. I think 60p is a, is a nice compromise between uh, not looking like a documentary of the football game we're shooting, uh, and uh, uh, the bandwidth is not so horrendous. Um, the people delivering content to the home, aside from streaming, 
are lagging woefully behind. And we can do whatever we want to increase the quality and get better cameras and nicer lenses and, 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 and so forth, but if, if, if when I put my feet up in the evening and I'm sipping my single malt, I'm seeing 420 MPEG at, uh, coming across at 12 or 13 megabits, um, 8 bit, uh, it's, it's not going to look very attractive. Well, do you think, is there a danger? Um, you know, let's take Netflix again, right? So, so I've, we, we've talked about this in some of our other events. You know, the fact is that we're all dealing with adaptive bitrate streaming. So you don't even know what bitrate you're getting because you can't necessarily say, you know what, I'm not, I don't want to get an image unless it's definitely 25 megabits per second, let's say. So is there a danger, you think, as we move into this, this world that the first UHD experience is going to be sort of, again, stepped on and not have the wow factor because we're just trying to get it to the home with adaptive technologies versus saying it's got to be locked and loaded and, and it's just top notch? Well, streaming is, is the ultimate adaptive technology. Uh, Netflix and Amazon will test your line and send you what they think you're capable of getting. And um, not so much now, but in the beginning, it would start off at, at below standard def, and then in a few seconds, they would figure out, and it would, it would amp up and amp up and amp up, and eventually, if you had the, the, the download speed, you, you would get maximum stuff. Um, the people on satellite and cable don't have that luxury. They have to send stuff out at a fixed bit rate. And uh, so uh, the streaming people have room to play, the cable and satellite people do not. And, and neither do the off-air people, if there's going to be any off-air left at all after the auction. Well, DirecTV is looking at 30 megabits per second, I believe, for their, their services when they get launched later this year in for the UHD services. So do you think that's enough? Uh, I know that there's a lot more than just bit rates. And then that's the next question is like people say, well, it's 30 megabits per second, so therefore it's got to be good. And you all know that's not necessarily the case either. It depends on the codec. And it also depends on what your, your data cap is nowadays. Uh, I mean, if you have, you know, 300 gigabits and you start watching a, a 4K movie and streaming that, you know, every hour you're going to be chewing up over, th over 10 gigs of that and possibly even more. And then you're going to reach your data cap, you know, within the end by the end of the week. Um, so I think that is also going to hurt the consumer base of being able to, to watch 4K at their house. But it could be good news for the broadcasters and the cable man. Could be. <laughs> they could have a, you know, maybe it's not all, all in high water. Also, another big factor is the network or, or distribution uh, entity. So if it's a, a three-letter broadcast traditional network, it's got to be a, a encoded, uh, decoded a number of times before it gets to the consumer's home, whereas something like Time Warner Sports, it's only one cycle of that, if you're lucky. So it, it, that's, a, that's another factor, and, and you know, the, the bandwidth number alone doesn't really help you. Oh, and then the TV sounds good. Wow. Okay. I'm sorry. I had a little something before lunch. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And, uh, I can't laugh about those noises uh, anymore. I'm sorry. sorry. And, uh, well, <laughs> okay, I lost my train of thought now. <laughs> Where were we? Oh, yes, the codex, the H265. Oh, H265 is, is, is supposedly going to be the savior of us all. Um, I have yet to see a real clean implementation where it's really working nicely. Um, and uh, I think that um, a lot of people are rushing. I've been doing, uh, in, the, in the last couple of months, I've done uh, several pilots uh, for Nickelodeon, um, and they insisted on shooting uh, UHD, so we used F55s. Um, somewhere around a third of their outlets are still standard def. We're shooting 4K 16.9 or 4.3, Standard def. I'm I'm not sure what the, what the, the the rationale is behind it, but you know the customer is always right. You want 4K, you got 4K. And and everything's monitored in 1080. There's 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 no 4K monitoring, uh, essentially. Um, the camera manufacturers are running slightly ahead of where the rest of the infrastructure is. Uh, the amount of uh, storage that's required for a, a, a nine-camera 4K show is breathtaking, unless you're going to step on it so hard that it may as well be DV. 
Right, and if you're going to do that, you might as well not be doing it in the first place, because if you're going to be capturing it at this full high resolution, and you want to actually have that in the can for future use and for having that uh, for, for future capabilities, you want to make sure that you're going to be able to put that away uh, in its pristine state. So you're absolutely correct. From an infrastructure perspective, you've got an awful lot of um, lead happening in the cameras. The cameras are spreading out this, these wonderful pictures, uh, but the infrastructure at this point is barely able to keep up with it, and the storage is even further behind. Well, Paul, let me let me uh, bring in for like the last word, and then we'll this last question. Maybe we'll start the conversation. Uh, there is this move to IP, which includes, a, and you mentioned it a little bit, that includes a whole new skill set as far as what being an engineer is all about. Um, how is Imagine, and you know, what do you see as the the challenge on the manufacturers to make sure these IP products almost look seamless, right? You almost want, in a weird way, you want to make them look like they're not IP-based products from an operational standpoint. So, what do you see as the challenge? from a manufacturing perspective as this move to IP and helping traditional broadcast engineers m more intuitively make the transition? Well, well it's multifold. I mean, you, you need to be able to pass the uh, signals through the equipment, uh, off-the-shelf hardware, interoperability, all that is important so that you can get the signals from their source on into the, uh, uh, through the router, through the uh, truck's frame, through to the switcher, through to the uh, end transmitter. Uh, or wherever it's going, um, but you're absolutely right. The control system is key to this because if you've got all of these operators, all the people that are running the trucks, all the people that are doing the productions, if they're walking up like Bob is and they walk up to the truck and they've got an alien piece of gear that they don't know how to use, you're not going to have a show. It's going to be a problem. So it's really up to the manufacturers to make sure that all this stuff is interoperable so that you can get best of breed, so that you can get the best signals from your uh, uh from your capture devices on through the chain, uh, and also to have the operators able to use that equipment in the same way that they're used to. So that, for example, in a router, you're going to be selecting your destination, you're going to select the source, you're going to hit take, and it's going to go there. The engineer on the truck, when it comes time to program that router, needs to be able to do that without opening up the manual and figuring out from scratch. And if they need an IT degree in order to start getting those signals from start to finish, you're not going to have a television engineer anymore. You're going to have an IT professional. And that might not be what you need to create a television broadcast. So it's really up to the manufacturers to make sure that that is taken care of in the design of the equipment. I think jo uh, Josh Steinhauer in his presentation this morning had a quote from Joe Inzarello about how you go to NEB and everyone wants to sell you their own digital end-to-end -end system. And he said, that's not going to happen. I think you mentioned interoperability. <coughs> that is the big concern here from all the engineers is, Look, we don't want to have to buy the Sony camera and have it work with a complete Sony work change. We do want the best of breed product. So from your all perspective, as far as this move to IP, what do you see is what has to happen from the manufacturing perspective? For me, I like it only just because it's less bandwidth down through the pipe, so it makes my job easier. Um, however, you still deal with latency issues. Um, a lot of companies do have it right with very minimal latency, but there will always be some. So if you, s if you are able to make a show uh, live and be able to pass it down to um, the to the broadcast studio, they can cut and do their shows. They like that idea. Um, but you do start, if there's any hiccup at all into that system whatsoever, <coughs> now you have a, a crash. Yes. And that's what you're going to face. I'm scared as heck of her IP. And I think we talked earlier about IP sounds great in a nice controlled environment like a studio. Um, but the rigors of production, mobile production, is challenging most of the time. And, you know, this is something about point-to-point -point piece of copper. I know I have a connection. And it's now it's just interpreting a bunch of numbers. It gets very scary for me. And, the, and for me, confidence is, is really important in the system. And, uh, you know, it would be nice if the manufacturers started talking together. Uh, every camera company, every manufacturer seems to go out and do their own thing to make them special. It would be really nice if if maybe they could uh, agree on a few things, you know, in the terminal world so that there was some continuity, so that if somebody walked up from one truck to another truck, y you know, it all made sense. Uh, I think that would be the success of it is if, the, if, it, if they made it familiar. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be a very long learning curve, I think. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, 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 I'm with Mark here. IP is a frightening thing. I think, uh, you know, it makes sense if you're building a fixed facility and you've got control of all the ends of the pieces. It makes perfect sense. 
Um, I think we're a bit premature in the field in trucks. Uh, I've seen a couple of, uh, I've, been, I've had the privilege of visiting a couple of sites, luckily not my job where I was responsible, but I got to see the, uh, the perils of that. And, and interestingly, uh, uh, this industry is there's a big sea change. I always tend to look at what the radio and audio and music people are doing because the audio world kind of adapts new digital, especially digital first, and let them work the bugs out. And I don't think the bugs are worked out on IP audio yet. I saw, uh, uh, I thought Dante was uh, was pretty well mature, NAB, everybody was doing Dante, Dante here, Dante there. Um, but I've seen some some catastrophe of Dante in the field. So it's, the bugs aren't quite worked out even in simple low bandwidth audio stuff. And we're uh, trying to embrace this 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 new world of 10 gigabit ports, which we, we talked about is, is not even enough for 4K. So. It's, a, it's not necessarily future-proof as the, the stuff I've seen right now, but uh, definitely need to keep an eye on it. I think uh, when I was talking with uh, uh, Mike Davis at Fox Sports after the World Series issue with the, they still don't know what caused that, th those two generators to, to go out simultaneously. Um, but, you know, the challenge now is, is th those trucks are now 300 supercomputers inside. And, you know, imagine it's bad enough with a live show if that happens, but then he said it was a, it was a miracle that, you know, everything rebooted and there were no issues because Lord knows you had to rebuild, rebuild the switcher. I mean, you're talking, well, we'll just see you tomorrow morning. I mean, this is right. I mean, it's ours. So that's the other big challenge I think I hear as far as these c computerized systems, IP bases, that when there's an issue, it could go really, you know. Yeah, and to that point, you need a different level of skill set backing up and all of the IT centric skill sets that, you know, you're backing up of your data, making sure that your configurations are all backed up just in case you need to reload them rather than build them from scratch is going to save you all that time. That's all part of that learning process and the training process of this new da new paradigm. We haven't even talked software updates and upgrades and version 5.6 and 5.7 and if the three three servers here are on 5.6 and these are on 5.8 and they can't talk, oh forget about it, right? And then the two trucks rolling up next to each other and they're on different versions and uh, it goes on for... All right, so thank you guys for taking part.